relief. <laughs> okay, great. That's all for you. Okay, well, welcome everybody to our first meeting of the Modern History Research Centre. And the title of today's meeting is Hampshire Days 1903 Wildlife and Rural Activism from the Hispanic Anglosphere. And we're looking at the ornithologist W.H. Hudson. And we've got two speakers, and we're starting off with Graciela. Dr. Graciela Iglesias Rogers, who's a colleague of mine in the history department, our very own Graciela, and she teaches modules on the global um, Hispanic world, on um, the Napoleonic Wars, and she is the lead, the principal investigator in the AHRC funded international research network project, the Hispanic Anglosphere. Transnational Networks, Global Communities, Late 18th to Early 20th Centuries, in partnership with the National Trust in Tintersfield, which is, has generated a lot of interest, workshops, conferences, yes. publications. So that's been, a, and this is part of that network, isn't it? Now, our guest speaker, our second speaker, is um, the award-winning author and longtime conservation cam campaigner, Connor Mark Jameson, and a very warm welcome to you. Um, he's going to talk about his recently published and groundbreaking biography, Finding W.H. Hudson, the writer who came to Britain to save the birds. And that was published um, this year. And Connor has also published um, Looking for the Goshawk in 2019 and also um, Silent Spring Revisited um, in 2019, which is, I think, a history of, of conservation isn't it, in this country, following on the famous work of Rachel Carson. So. Um, a very warm welcome, and I'll hand over now to Graciela to, to start. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I want briefly to stake my flag on this topic <laughs> a little bit uh, by uh, talking today about the author, very briefly, the book, giving you a brief description of the book, then my argument that has two uh, sides of it, one is I argue that this book was informed by Hudson's experience in and also his attachment to the Hispanic world. And also what I argue is that it's not a sentimental account of a bygone era, but actually it's a rallying call to defend biodiversity and rural heritage. And, and it's a call with lots of echo today. So let's go straight into who was William Henry Hudson. And I'm going to be very brief because Connor, who has been spending a few years researching him, will be able to tell you far more than what I can say. But certainly he was born on 4th August 1841 on a small ranch, Los 25 Ombúes, the 25 Ombúes, which are beautiful uh, variety of trees, on the banks of a stream which flows into the River Plate. Uh, near the locality of Quilmes in the Buenos Aires province. Now it's part of the suburban area of Buenos Aires, uh, but then was part of the sovereign state uh, of Buenos Aires within the Argentine Confederation that eventually will become Argentina. And he died in Worthington, England, on 18 August 1922. He was the fourth son of, uh, fourth child, sorry, not son, the fourth child of Daniel Hudson, who was a farmer, and his wife, Caroline Augusta Kimball. Both of them were US citizens from New England who had emigrated to South America in the 1830s. And Hudson's paternal grandfather had been English. He was from Devon. And that seems to have at times encouraged Hudson to refer to Exeter as his natal city, uh, leaving aside that actually Hudson only put foot on in, in England age 33. Hudson was brought up on the family ranch uh, Las Acacias. So he was not born brought up in the small ranch, but actually more inside the province of Buenos Aires, uh, an area that even today is still quite green and uh, relatively not wild, but less tame than perhaps the areas in the suburban area where he was born. And uh, and he was there uh, where he was allowed to run wild 
associating with neighboring English, Scottish, Irish, and U.S. settlers, as well as the gaucho herdsmen and the native aborigines, which developed, and that helped him to develop a passion for the wildlife of the Pampas, the plains of Argentina, and particularly the birds there on which he was going to become an authority. And I want to give just a very quick context of how this happened to understand also the man, because at the time that he was in Argentina, he himself was part of an enormous migration of people from Europe to the Americas, and particularly British. And in the middle of the 19th century, uh, the biggest uh, foreign community in Argentina was the British community. So it was very uh, normal to hear people speaking English, and there were two English newspapers running daily. Um, so it was slightly different to what you may encounter today in Argentina. Although still, obviously, there's a lot of uh, English-speaking presence. Now, his education uh, was rather uh, unorthodox because he never went to a school. Uh, he had three leave-in tutors, two of whom were rather unreliable and ill-suited to the task. But he happened to have, because of his parents, a library at home of 400 volumes which was quite extraordinary for the time and even for the place. And at 15, following an attack of typhus, Hudson became largely self-taught, discovering the pleasure of good reading and particularly the letters of the pioneering English naturalist, ecologist and ornithologist, Gilbert White, compiled in his famous The Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne. Uh, first published in 1789. Later in his teens, rheumatic fever brought on by overexertion during a cattle drive left him with chronic heart disease. An illness dogged him for the rest of his life, but also led him to favor long pause walkings and detailed observation of the sort of sort of testosterone fuel stunts that boys were expecting to thrive on at the time. And in 1864, regardless of his physical limitations, he was conscripted uh, with his older brother, Daniel, uh, in the cavalry regiment number 13 of the Guardias Nacionales. And the Guardias Nacionales was a recently created um, national army uh, that in that, that particular regiment had been sent to fight in the frontier with the aboriginal uh, territories in the south. And uh, we don't know very much about his experience there, um, but we know enough as to ascertain that he certainly was there in the frontier of the Rio Azul in the south, and that he had to keep in contact with hostile Indians and that had to be kept at bay and that he had to endure the hard life in the forts. And part of the life in the forts was pretty much doing during months on end nothing. So boredom was killed by recourse to books, to the extent that later in life, he reckoned that nearly went blind through reading too much. Still, he managed to find time for occasional visits to a nearby estancia, the Estancia Pedernales, that was owned by an English farmer, George Keen, whose son, George Edward Keen, became a lifelong friend of Hudson, and he was going to meet him later in London, too. More importantly, this family had been host of Charles Darwin when he traveled, uh, he was in Buenos Aires uh, during his famous uh, trip with the Beagle in 1833. Between 1866 and 1869, Hudson uh, started to collect bird skins, uh, particularly to send them to the Smithsonian Institution in the United States. In 1870, he became a corresponding member of the Zoological Society of London, and by a letter published in its proceedings, persuaded Charles Darwin to correct a misleading statement in his origin of the species about Pampas good peckers. And we have to say that although he accepted the notion of evolution, Hudson remained rather skeptical about the uh, notion of natural selection as the sole cause of 
biological change. He, he always had a bit of uh, criticism regarding Darwin. He spent 1871 observing birds in the Valley of Rio Negro in Patagonia, where he discovered a new species of tyrant bird that subsequently was named Cipulegus hudsoni in his honor. And uh, again, we don't know what happened very much in that period of his life, but it's clear that he decided to emigrate. Um, there's people who said that Hudson became alarmed by what he had seen as the effects of the to, in the Pampas ecosystem of this mass European migration, uh, particularly a migration that was composed by bird eating Europeans. Uh, particularly the Italians who have a, a thing of eating everything that was there available. And it, there's people who said that that was one of the reasons. Really, we don't know. But there, what, real, what we do know is that on 1st April 1874, he took passage on the Royal Mail steamer Ebro for England, and he's, he traveled to his self-style spiritual country. Uh, and he arrived here in Southampton, and so he, he, the first place that he put foot on was in Hampshire. But the first uh, 10 years of his residence in England proved really very hard. He only managed to publish nine articles in popular journals and four in the Zoological Society's Proceedings. And um, he was really unsuccessful in obtaining employment as a naturalist because I, I was a little bit... Um, um, uh, I found amusing that Chris described Hudson as an ornithologist because he will not consider himself an ornithologist. Um, he considered himself very much a naturalist. And he tried to um, fortune as a writer, and even he went into uh, writing fiction. And But the first two books proved to be pretty much uh, a disaster. They, they didn't sell. In the meantime, he married here Emily Wingrave, who was a former professional singer and daughter of a senior civil servant. And for a decade, they lived from the income generated from Emily running their London homes as boarding houses. A donation of 40 pounds from the Royal Society finally enabled him to contribute significantly to a two volume Argentine ornithology produced by somebody else, by Dr. P.L. Sclater, who was the secretary of the Zoological Society. In 1888, Emily inherited a mortgage house in Bayswater, and they retained a few rooms for themselves and let the remaining as flats. And with the rent, they managed to pay the interest in the mortgage and more or less survive. His first great success, an individual success, arrived in 1892 with a collection of open air essays and entitled The Naturalist in La Plata. And when he talks about La Plata, he talks not about the capital of Buenos Aires, which is the name of today, but he talks about the River Plate area. So the naturalist of the River Plate area. And that was reviewed in nature by no other than Alfred Russell, uh, Russell Wallace, who, the pioneering scientific explorer, geographer, anthropologist and biologist, who called the book a remarkable book on the habits of animals, which in his opinion was altogether unique among books of natural history. And that encouraged him to publish Idle Days in Patagonia a year later, and that also had great acclaim. So when he was writing about his South America, things were successful. That uh, encouraged him though to start in 1892 to explore the English countryside. And he got a commission to write a popular reference book of British birds, uh, first in Northumberland, so uh, British birds of Northumberland. And in 1899, he traveled around the Sussex Downs and the experience resulted in his celebrated Nature in Downlands that was published in 1900. That year, June 1900, is the year when he became naturalized British, a British subject. And on 9 August 1901, he was awarded a civil lease pension of 150 pounds per year in recognition for the originality of his writings in on natural history. This regular income enabled him to rumble the southern English counties, observing all forms of fauna and flora, as well as the country folk that he was going to describe 
in his finest and highly influential rural classic Hampshire days. So I'm going to go quickly through the book. The book has 13 chapters, and some of these chapters are actually um, uh, things that he had already published in, in articles, uh, published in, in the Longman magazine and the Batman magazine. So it's not 100% uh, original, but there's a lot of things that he added to that material that he had already published. When he talks about Hampshire, he established the territorial limits uh, that are not necessarily the territorial limits of today, but it says from the world run cornfields, which once uh, was once Roman Caleva, that's Silchester, to the Solent, and from the beautiful wild rodder on the Sussex border to the Avon in the West. He visited Hampshire several times uh, before writing this book, and not necessarily for writing the book, but one of the things that he says that the, he, the first English cathedral that he had. Uh, observed in England was the one of Winchester. And uh, also he had been in Hampshire for personal uh, curiosity because uh, the dictator uh, uh, Juan Manuel de Rosas uh, was buried in St. Hampton. I mean, he lived in St. Hampton in exile and he wanted to see the house where Rosas had been living. Uh, so he did pay visits to Hampshire, not just for the purposes of the book, but certainly all of those visits serve to inform the book. Now, uh, the book doesn't talk only about birds. It talks about stuck beetles, weasel, others, plants like wild max, the mimulus luteus, and even he talks about aerial algae. And also talks about people. There's a snapshot of human presence through the book, including what he himself called the imprudent chapter 11. And I'm going to talk quickly later about that. Um, where he got the information from? I said that he had visited Hampshire several times. Well, he got it mainly from common people. Uh, and the book is full of references to uh, a keeper in Hampshire told me that, or good things come out from talking to the water keeper on, on the test. So it's always common people and particularly from talking with women. And there's an account of the Selborn mob that was an attack on poor houses that ended in the transportation of several people in the 1820s, and that so far people didn't know about it. And he tells this story. And he got the story by talking with a landlady whose mother had known Chilver White, who was uh, the vicar of the area, and had survived three husbands. So all... all his contact with women were very important. And um, I mentioned in, in, in the blurb of the publicity of this talk that he was an undeclared feminist because he was always in connection with women and he always valued the opinion of women. And I'm sure Connor is going to talk much about that because he was there at the time when the, the, this society, the, well, the, it's not the Royal Society for Protection of Birds because they became Royal Society later on, but the Society for Birds that was established by Emily Wilkinson in 1889. And he was very much uh, part of that process of, and he became later a counselor of the RSPB. So, and that was through the connection to these very important women who were pivotal in establishing that society. So quickly, my argument, because I say that it's a product of the Hispanic Anglosphere. And we can see it because of his research methods, which are exactly the same research methods that he used in Argentina. Uh, <coughs> that meant meeting regular people, that meant staying, uh, not in hotels, but in cottages uh, and not living in luxury, but living really as close to nature as possible. And that's what he did in the Pampa, who, who, that he learned to do in the Pampa and Patagonia, because in the big extenses of Pampa and Patagonia, there are no hotels. So you have to rely on the people who are there and whoever are generous enough to help you. And he did all the time the same here too. So he stayed in a fishing cottage on the River Eachin in the state of Sir Edward and Lady Grey, to whom he dedicated the book, and also in a rather horrible cottage, cottage in Selborne, a myrtle cottage that had not even proper running water. Now, more 
more importantly, all his observation or most of his observations are informed by his experience in the Hispanic world. So Alfred Russell Wallace once asked him to look into the behavior of the cuckoo on the nest because there was a controversy regarding that bird's alleged knowledge of how to best eject other eggs from the nest. So he observes a robin's nest with three eggs occupied by a cuckoo and established that the first one to hatch was the cuckoo because he said long ago I found that this was so in the case of the parasitical trupials of the genus Molorosus in South America and the Molothrus bonaerensis or shiny cauda is a brood parasite re that relies on a host to incubate its eggs. And when he went into describing the efforts of the cuckoo in pushing the other eggs out of the nest, he said that these changes in the bird strongly remind me of a person with an epileptic fit, as I have seen, as I have been accustomed to see it on the pampas, where among the gauchos, epilepsy is one of the commonest maladies. The sudden rigidity of muscle in some weak, sickly, flabby looking person the powerful grip of the hand, the strength in struggling, exceeding that of a man in perfect health, and finally, when this state is over, the weakness of complete exhaustion. When he talks about the hornet, he tells, I admire and greatly respect him this last feeling dating back to my experience of was during my early life in South America, and goes to tell the story of how he grasped uh, it was a hornet uh, and thinking that he was going to be like a regular wasp, but he was he was beaten. Uh, when he talks about green grasshoppers uh, or leaf cricket, he says he belongs to a family widely distributed on the earth. And in La Plata, I was familiar with two species, which in form and color, a uniform vivid green, were just like our viridissima, but different size, one being smaller and the other twice in large, and goes on. Uh, when he marvels, uh, even when he starts marveling about the wide uh, presence of the uh, wild mask, the Mimulus lucius, he also admits that its attractiveness was to me greatly increased by association. And he says the masses of the plant as one may see it in September at Ovington and at many other points on the Itchin, from its source to Southampton water and on the test, I am strongly reminded of the yellow camalote of the South American water courses, that the memory is almost like an illusion. And indeed, it's a little bit of an illusion because the camalote is not yellow, it's mainly purple. It's used to display in Argentina. Well, this was the sun produced in the 1980s, but you can see that it was not yellow, it was purple. But obviously, what he uh, had in his memory was the enormous mass presence of it. Now, um, not only he drew on similarities, but also in contrast. And, and when he talked about the dragonfly, he said in South America, I was accustomed to see dragonflies in rushing hordes, but in Britain as single insects, not hordes. And the Hispanic world is even present when he talks about people. And that's when we get into this imprudent chapter 11. Uh, we have to say that he defined Britain as a land of many mixed races. And that he opened admitting that he was not an anthropologist. But somehow he felt compelled to include a chapter on the people of Hampshire. And we know that he wrote a letter to uh, Emma Hubbard, who was incidentally, I forgot to mention that she had been pivotal in illustrating, the illustra many of the illustrations of the book were made by this woman, and um, Emma Hubbard. And he said there uh, in a letter 25 January, uh, possibly 1903, could have been 1902, we don't know, but certainly a letter that when he was writing the book, I suppose I shall have to run down to Winchester and try to get three or four human subjects for the unfinished chapter to be included. The book I fancy is long enough without it, 
but it would perhaps be as well to put in something about the species Homo or the Hampshire variety, which is not sapiens, <laughs> but he's here making a joke. He had quite a uh, acid humor, uh, Hudson, and, 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 and it, he was not meant to be taken seriously with that, but definitely he decided to do something about people. And when he decided to do something about people, he drew a definition uh, from Huxley's and also from Havelock Ellis um, about the ethnicity of people. And apparently there was uh, a term used that we will use now referring to the Celt. People at the time referred to the Iberian type. And he thought that the people in Hampshire were mainly from the Iberian type. Uh, although he found two varieties, one that was blonde, the other one that was dark. And it happens to be that he thought that the one that was dark and that it was more akin to the Iberian type was the one that had more character, that certainly was more interesting, and that uh, the one that was blue eyes and uh, pale was perhaps not so appealing. And he does reflect and acknowledge that this is mainly drawing on his own racial prejudices. He says, with the dark side, the strongest in me, I search myself. And the only evidence I find of such feeling is an ineradicable dislike of the shallow, frosty blue eye. It makes me shiver and seems to indicate a cold, petty, spiteful and false nature. Having said that, he also noticed that those with blue eyes who consider themselves liberal minded did likewise with those who were dark. So what we can say is that with all this, I hope that by now you, you will agree with me that you could take the man from the Hispanic world, but you cannot take the Hispanic world from the man. And that this was certainly a product of the Hispanic Anglosphere. Uh, all his uh, references and connections are informed and shaped by his experiences and his attachment to the Hispanic world. Now, the other side of my argument is that is, this book is a rallying call to defend biodiversity and rural heritage. Now, Hudson worked from the premise that we are all part of nature. Uh, and he also warn us about dangers posed by humans. Um, he was still very much a man living uh, with candles and actually driving horses and uh, relying increasingly on a bike rather than on a car. And he was, if he could avoid getting himself on a car, he would do it uh, because he feared the impact of the car. And he talks in the book about that. Not because of how the car is going to kill animals, which indeed we know it does, uh, but because they were bringing masses of people to wild areas. He was also alarmed by the negative impact of overdevelopment. And there are many references in the book to the problems created by overdevelopment. He talks about modern hideous Italy and the Stanadu or the mighty ones of the money markets they were building these brand new big houses built by overrich stock shovers on many hills and open hills in Surrey and alas in Hampshire as well. And he talks about the negative impact, not just on nature, but also on rural heritage, because these townies decided to do away with ruins of ancient churches and to improve small chapels, turning them into massive churches with coal very interiors. There's also a lot of criticism of the naturalist establishment, particularly the world of the collectors. And he mentioned a, a lithotherapist, Bicar, who considered himself a man of science, but spent the day trying to catch moths with a new, uh, with, without realizing that moths are night creatures, uh, and also who saw in nature nothing but something to be collected. And among the criticisms, uh, there's a criticism to somebody who he had admired for many years, which was Chilbert White. And he said, Chilbert White lived in an age 
which had its own little firmly established conventional ideas about nature, which he, open air man though he was, did not escape or else found felt bound to respect. Thus, the prolonged, wild, beautiful call of the peacock, the finest sound made by any domesticated creature, was to the convention of the day disgustful. And as a disgustful sound, he set it down accordingly. And when he speaks of the keen pleasure it gave him to listen to the field cricket, he writes in a somewhat apologetic strain. He's also concerned about the impact of ecotourism and indeed the impact on Selborne and the day visitors who had no real interest in Chilbert White and his work, and even less on the village that he lived in, and that um, also is, is fearful of the impact of this member of what he said, a member of that innumerable tribe of gathers about the land who religiously visit every spot which they are told should be seen. And the same situation he finds in the New Forest, particularly in uh, that he describes as the spot on which London vomits out its annual crowd of collectors. And, and this collector who fill its numerous and ever increasing brand new red brick lodging houses and who swarm through all the adjacent goods and his men, women and children, hateful little pricks with their basculums, beer and trickle pots green and blue butterfly nets, killing bottles and all the detestable paraphernalia of what they would probably call nature study. And that's because he also predicated the motto for him was pet nothing and persecute nothing. So essentially leave nature alone. And indeed there's a lot of reflection in the book about issues of naturalization and rewilding. He asked questions about uh, what is an introduced plant, because the wild mass at the time was considered as an introduced plant. Um, and he thought, well, that's ridiculous. For generations, people have been seeing this plant. And it's true at the time of Chilbert White, that plant was not widely spread, but by the time the center, two centuries almost later, it was spread. So what is really native? Uh, so he's asking really good questions that chime with the sort of things that we are talking now uh, in society. And finally, he talks about the importance of campaigning. He was an incredibly big campaigner, real activist. And sometimes people say, well, why to spend time campaigning? Nothing changes. And he said, well, really, I know um, things might not change in my lifetime, but we have to keep on doing it because public opinion and the desire of the people for anything is a considerable force today. And indeed, I think we, we need to celebrate the fact that we have men like Hudson uh, who have set us on the way of protecting biodiversity. And now I want to pass the, 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 the button to, to Connor, who is going to tell you much more on that and on many other things relating Hudson. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gracia. Yeah. Thank you. That was yes. um, that was great. Um, and I, I learned a few things uh, myself there that I, I either forgotten or didn't know about Hudson. Um, and actually, had I known what he'd said about people with blue eyes, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I would be standing. Anyway, that's <laughs> he also seemed to have it into the Scots a bit. I think it was a bit tongue in cheek, um, but yeah, it's all good fun. Um, so yes, he was a man of strong opinions, old Huddy. Um, so I'm going to quickly rattle through um, just to complement what Graciela has told you, uh, and just explain a bit about why I got so interested in this chap that I ended up devoting a few years of my life to to pulling together this this biography. Um, so yes, my, it's uh, finding W. H. Hudson, uh, and yes, with a particular emphasis today on Hampshire and uh, the origins of the chap. Um, so yes, uh, and quickly, who are you listening to? I, I mean, I worked for most of my career at the RSVB headquarters in Sandy in Bedfordshire, uh, and um, and I write books in my sort of spare time, uh, and my 
nieces very kindly pretend to read them. Um, uh, uh, so, so Hudson is the man above the fireplace in the main meeting room in this Victorian house in Bedfordshire. And so I, I've been, he's been familiar to me for, for a quarter of a century. But it was only towards the end of my time there that I started to, in a sense, get to know him. And it was through researching about the Goshawk that I, um, uh, in a sense, you know, the more you find out about somebody, the more intrigued you become. And so I'd be researching in the library uh, and uh, discovered that he's a bit of a kindred spirit and very interesting man and a great storyteller, but above all. Uh, and so I got sort of drawn in. And when I was finding sort of bits of his handwritten notes uh, in the archive there, uh, and then um, maybe principally it was the discovery that far from being a, 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 a typical collector naturalist of the era um, who might live in and come from a big country house like the Lodge, Hudson, of course, did something much more interesting than that. He was he was born here uh, and um, uh, and, you know, what looks like a sort of a, a, a derelict um, farm outbuilding. And uh, and yes, the young Hudson can be brought to life for us. Um, uh, in Argentina, of course, you know, where he's he's still revered and celebrated. There was a, a, a film made of his early life back in the, I think, 60s, 70s. And so he, anyway, here's a, I'm stealing an image to give you a picture of the young nature-loving Hudson um, growing up in this extraordinary environment at that time um, in the middle of uh, the 19th century and wonderful birds like the Cardinal. And of course, as Graciela mentioned, he was his imagination was fired by books on his parents' uh, bookshelves, and particularly things like Gilbert White's Selborne, of course, in Hampshire itself. Um, and um, yes, never having to go to school and having this kind of semi-feral existence. And I think of it as a bit like the Waltons meets Little House on the Prairie. You know, um, he's got his North American parents and he's got his English ancestry, but he's also got Irish ancestry. And I think these uh, all these kind of cultural things obviously shaped him. And of course, Argentina at that time, as Graciela said, was a you know, cultural sort of melting pot of sort of, you know, movements of people globally. And Hudson went against the grain a bit when he kind of came back, in a sense, to the land of his ancestors. And so, yes, he had this extraordinary um, and slightly mysterious sort of young adult life. Um, and of course, must have been greatly shaped by that. And I mean, who knows what sort of things he witnessed in that sort of lawless gaucho sort of wild west of the south sort of environment and the time in the army as well. Um, and so, yes, and he, he got found himself corresponding with, you know, the, the big scientists and the big institutions in North America and London and, you know, corresponding in, in letters that have since been published. Um, and then, yes, done, did this migration. This is actually the migration route of the, the Manx Shearwater, but you take the point, you know, it's a... <laughs> So he lands in Southampton, he lands in Hampshire on a May morning in 1874. And of course, you know, this this blows his mind. He's been a month on a, on a boat crossing the Atlantic. And then he lands in springtime uh, and explores Southampton, which at that time is the same size as Buenos Aires, a couple of hundred thousand people. And he's a, a, I'm amazed by how, you know, civilised Southampton is. I mean, since then, <laughs> you may disagree. Um, okay. uh, but Buenos Aires, I mean, since that time has, has grown to uh, a city of 15 million people. Obviously, you know, it's been a rapidly changing world. And yes, uh, Hudson had started to see the, the big changes that were happening. So his kind of great open, unfenced pampas was changing into something much more um, divided up. And so he, he told, told a lovely and I think um, instructive and sort of um, story about how when he landed in Southampton, all, all the people on the ship were desperate to get to London to seek their fortunes. And Hus uh, Hudson said, no, I'm not coming with you. Well, not yet. He said, I want to go into the countryside and find English birds about which I've read so much, but know almost nothing. And so he went down sort of Netley Way, uh, which some of you will know, and had this you know amazing um, experience uh, and quite a comical experience with a a boy on a pony and trap who he'd hired, who of course could tell him nothing. And Hudson was just desperate to know what these birds were. And the point being really that this was all new to Hudson and, and exotic. Um, and he went on to achieve extraordinary things from this very standing start, age 33. Um, and so, you know, wonderful birds, uh, familiar to us, but completely new to him. Um, and so, yes, he passed by Gilbert White's house and would uh, soon pay it a visit. 
pay homage or pilgrimage there. And then, yes, he um, started to collaborate with Philip Sclater, the head of the Zoological Society. And of course, um, this is again defining because this is where Hudson's dream sort of almost dies immediately when you know he meets the establishment and realizes actually he's not going to make a living as a naturalist or ornithologist anytime soon because of his lack of education and uh, lack of knowledge, frankly, at that time. Um, but also this fundamental sort of cultural uh, clash, which you might also say was a bit of a complementary thing. But yes, um, he um, was quickly, I think, um, dismayed by the prevailing approach to natural history at that time, which was all about collecting and classification of dead things in labs, museums. And Hudson had known, of course, a lot of the things they had in those museums, etc., in all their living glory, like the hummingbirds. And so, um, rattling through the story, Hudson um, runs out of money. He's desperately poor and he's sleeping rough in Hyde Park. Um, so this is how bad it got for him. Um, well, we say that, but I mean, you know, sleeping out under the stars was second nature to him. And so perhaps, you know, um, he never made a big thing of it. Um, but yes, he was rescued by um, the woman he married, Emily. Uh, and uh, yeah, they would occasionally get out of London um, for walks, but they were desperately short of money. And those were very, very difficult years for him, 10 or 15 years that he didn't like to talk about. And then slowly the publishing success came, desperately slowly, but finally, you know, he was publishing novels. I mean, they weren't great, a great success and they weren't money spinners by any means, but they were the breakthroughs that I think set him on the road to the publishing, sort of extraordinary publishing career he would have. Um, but the other major turning point in the campaigning thing, which actually defines Hudson and has been my principal interest in bringing out is how he came to be the only man in the room when the women got organised to create what he always called the Bird Society, which is useful shorthand for what we now know today as the RSPB. And yes, women like Margareta Lemon, who went on to be the driving force, and Winifred, the Duchess of Portland, who was the aristocratic figurehead as president. I think it's well rehearsed now that the main focal point of their efforts was to end the global plumage campaign which was no mean ambition. I mean, this was a multi-million dollar global industry, um, but it was about all sorts of threats to birds at that time. So it was the women who got organised to change things. Uh, Hudson didn't like the gentlemen's clubs, um, and he quickly you know, realised that these are my people. And that's fascinating, and that's all to do, I think, with where Hudson comes from, the fact that you know, he's countercultural, um, and he, he's almost like an explorer here, you know, um, normally our sort of Victorian explorers went from here to somewhere else. Hudson came here and with that sort of very fresh perspective, was able to see things here in a very new and novel way. Um, Edward Gray and Lady Dorothy Gray, um, uh, who I've actually visited today, well, this cottage on the Etchin, um, just along at Etchin Abbas, um, which is a wonderful place. I, I don't have time to tell you all the details, but see me after if you want to know. Um, but we've been there today um, looking at the site of this wonderful place that Hudson was given the keys to. And it's where he um, principally in the summer of 1900 spent several months with Emily. And it was a, the only time they ever had a long holiday together. Um, and of course, yeah, brought together um, Hampshire Days, about which Graciela has told us. Um, a lot. Um, the other fascinating thing that I didn't know about Hudson and loved finding out was how well connected he became despite himself and despite his sort of famous shyness and publicity shunning sort of life, is that he got to know some extraordinary and stellar names in literature and he would dine weekly in Soho at a French restaurant with these folk. Um, and the ringleader of it all was a, a publisher's reader called Edward Garnett, another fascinating character. Um, and there were people like Ian Forster, uh, Edward Thomas, John Galsworthy, Joseph Conrad in this circle. Um, but it was Hudson who fascinated him most. And I think this is one of the most significant of the quotes, of the many quotes given by you know, important people about Hudson. Something about Hudson's character um, that just intrigued him. Um, and he 
like most of Hudson's friends, kept all the letters that Hudson sent, and so a lot of those were subsequently published. Um, this classic, uh, th this is the basis of the portrait above the fireplace. This is a photo taken in the New Forest, um, and uh, in order to illustrate um, Hampshire days, and that publication in 1903 roughly coincides with the Bird Society really going places, really taking off. I mean, the plumage campaign was proving a long drawn out affair. But they got a royal charter, they got support from Queen Victoria. Um, Winifred was well connected with the new king and particularly uh, Queen Alexandra. Uh, and uh, this was also the year where they launched their magazine. Hudson's big money spinning book, Green Mansions, uh, sort of a, a, a romance of the tropical forest. Um, I think partly um, inspired by the New Forest and his um, time there. And this was greatly championed by John Goldsworthy, another uh, very prominent animal <laughs> rights activist, an all round good egg. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature. So this, this chap is the creme de la creme almost, the writers. Um, and he really um, supported Hudson um, and helped him break America. Uh, and Hudson then started to make a lot of money, but it was never for himself. He was always saving his money to give to the cause of bird conservation. So um, then he discovers um, Martin in what is, let me get this right, now Wiltshire, but was Hampshire. So you can claim that a bit. I don't, I don't want to cause any border tensions, but... Uh, <laughs> um, Anyway, worth noting, and his classic um, study, anthropological study, and again, I think borrowing very much from um, his early life experience of just loving sort of knocking people's doors and sort of inviting himself to stay and hating guest houses and hotels, but always loving to be in the sort of, um, you know, embedded in real people's everyday lives. Um, so he's a bit of a philanthropist as well as an archaeologist and a naturalist. And anyway, the campaign on plumage, you know, escalates because the efforts to change hearts and minds isn't working. Sadly, the plumage industry is too big and powerful. Um, so they go for the legislation option um, and uh, demonstrations in, I think this one's in Oxford Street. World War I comes uh, after the sort of golden age of the Edwardian decades. Uh, and it's just interesting to follow the, the, the fortunes of things through that time. Of course, all the political campaigning came to a halt. Um, Hudson stayed busy, um, but became very ill um, towards the end of the war. And it was while he was ill that he had his visions of childhood and wrote his classic memoir of childhood far away and long ago. And it really is, I mean, it stands the test of time, this book. It's a wonderful book. Um, just vivid uh, how he remembered characters and people from that time. Um, and the early formative experiences that inspired his life um, as a naturalist and his desire to save it, save beautiful things um, uh, from the worst excesses of um, progress. It's often said that Hudson wanted everything burned. He wanted to be forgotten. Um, a lot was burned and he certainly burned most of the stuff he had still in his own possession in terms of notes and letters. But thankfully, most of his friends ignored his wish, knowing I think the importance of his stuff. Um, so there's a few surviving things, a very, very few action shot photographs, but his friends thought that this was the most characteristic and it's probably the most relaxed image of him um, with a smile on his face and a raven on his knee. Uh, this is him almost 80 years old, still got a wee cigar going. I mean, it's often said that he <laughs> had a dodgy heart from a very early age, but he did well, he lived to 81. Um, so yeah, it, the raven's making him happy. This is the deck, uh, deck chair in the Hampshire garden. Now the happy part is that he lived just long enough to see the Plumage Act finally become law in April, 1922. So he lived for another three months. So that's happy. And he also lived just long enough to see the first meeting in London of international conservationists getting together to get organised globally because of the realisation, and Hudson knew it better than most, that this had to be a joined up international thing. 
There's no point in banning the import of plumage to London if it just goes to Paris, New York or Hamburg. Um, he was such a big deal and name by the end of his life that they basically gave a chunk of Hyde Park to the man. Um, so not only this enormous sculptor, sculpture depicting Grima from Green Mansions, again, a whole talk in its own right, but um, uh, you know, half an acre of, of the park itself as a sanctuary. There's a footnote, uh, which is that in um, this lovely book, he didn't have time to finish, um, so it was finished for him by his colleague Linda Gardner, in which he compiles and pays for himself with these new colour illustrations that are possible, uh, a book about everything we'd already lost, um, uh, including the eagles and egrets, etc. But the happy part, again, is that most of these birds are back because of conservation action. Most of them are back. Um, I could go through them, but there isn't time. And he would love, of course, that there's now a partner organisation doing this stuff in Buenos Aires uh, called Aves Argentina. And this is a few years ago when they came over as part of a campaign uh, supported by the bird watching fair here to create uh, a national park at the Mar Chiquita in South America, vast inland salt lake. Um, so they came to here and in the exchange I went to Buenos Aires to visit their office where of course I find that they have a, a library named after Hudson, they have more <coughs> Hudson material even than the RSPB and he's still regarded as, I don't need to translate do I, but um, and then they took me to see the Mar Chiquita and all the flamingos there. And of course, they took me to on a pilgrimage to this lovingly restored um, natal home of Hudson. Just rediscovered in the 1930s, uh, looking a bit like this. And then, yeah, lovingly um, put back um, uh, to this museum, um, uh, which celebrates his life and his, many of his friends, like I have to mention Don Roberto Cunningham Graham, another hugely important person, the kind of um, the sort of dual heritage between uh, here and uh, South America, um, and a, a great man, another radical campaigning uh, individual who thought the world of Hudson. Um, and yeah, um, I'm going to need a bigger suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyone translate El Maz Inglés de los Gauchos, the most English of the Gauchos. I like that headline. And yeah, Green Mansions, uh, another footnote, um, bought by Hollywood. So they gave him a load of money. Right at the end of his life, he was negotiating hard with the Hollywood studios on the Cornish headland to, again, just to get as much money out of the Americans as he could. Not for himself, but to put towards bird conservation. He left almost all of it to the RSPB. Um, and so nowadays you find his natal home run as a outdoor education center, um, Casa El Ecologica. And last year was the centenary of Hudson's death. Loads of stuff going on in South America and books being published, etc. Not so much happening here, um, but uh, yeah, that's another story. Uh, so by the end of his life, and let's remember that late start. So he's nearly 50 before he published any books. And by the end of his life, Three decades later, 24 volumes. And again, a mix of fiction, non-fiction, nature, um, uh, book, children, children's books. So he was very diverse. Um, yeah. His real strong suit, I think, was the um, the nature writer. Um, but yes, translations uh, into Spanish, uh, lots of repackaging of his work towards the end of his life for the North American market is where the money was. And yeah, um, the tributes paid to him uh, by people who knew him best, um, I think, uh, you know, are what matter. Um, but yeah, there was something about his character. It's quite hard to put your finger on. I mean, I, I know in his letters, he's got the acid, uh, acidic sort of um, uh, sense of humour. And I mean, yeah, he, <laughs> I think he'd be very scathing about built up areas, as we've seen. Um, and uh, but yeah, he um, yeah he he, he certainly um, he had a, ma a magnetism, I think, and uh, and yes, just a very very important, and I think to a large extent, certainly here overlooked uh, individual. Um, I think it might be partly because you don't achieve, you know, um, painful 
legislative change without upsetting um, often quite important people. So anyway, um, I've been keen to restore him uh, and to bring him to life from that painting. Um, uh, I, I, but yeah, I, I like this quote too from his friend Don Roberto, who thought so much of Hudson that at the age of 84, Don Roberto, as his last act, left Britain to make that arduous Atlantic crossing again, which took three or four weeks to make his own pilgrimage to Hudson's natal home and to sit in that semi-derelict building as it was before it was restored and to write a letter home. And this is one of the things he said. Um, and he died in Buenos Aires a few days later. So anyway, I hope there's time for chats and yeah. questions yeah. and that's and great. however you want to, to play it. But that's a sort of very potted history of, of, of Hudson. Uh, to follow on from what Gracio said. Thank you, Conor. That was a fascinating, richly illustrated tilt. <coughs> Thank you again to Gratiella for her pregnant and insightful study of, of how he constantly drew on his earlier life as, as part of her project on the um, Hispanic atmosphere. So let's have some questions. I'm sure you have um, questions for, for Conor and Graciela. There we are. We're back again here in, in the screen. <laughs> so. Questions from the floor. Oh, yes. the floor first. Or would you like to know something more? Yes. Yeah. Just thinking of your the passion, you talked about Hudson's campaigning. And then I thought, well, how much has changed when um, uh, Chris Packham yeah. is jailed for protesting against dining in Malta? And I wondered whether you'd approach personalities who are right at the edge of legality, like Chris Packham, who's linked to the Hawke Conservancy of Way Hill, for instance, to try and give Hudson a bit of a push. Is, is that for me? It's better to you, sorry. Um, well, I, I, I haven't personally um, approached uh, Chris, um, but, but I don't know him personally. Um, uh, but your frustration that we didn't respect him and his pioneering legacy as much as we should. Mm. That, that's what I felt. What you said. I don't well, I just don't think it's been understood. I mean, I think to be to be honest, I mean, perhaps I should have said that. I mean, I was able to disentangle it from Hudson's letters, um, and Hudson's letters primarily reside now in North America, which is where they were bought by collectors after his death, because that's where the, the auctions made the big money. And Hudson was quite happy to, for his friends to sell his letters uh, in America. I think he possibly thought that they would be, you know, forgotten there. Or, you know, I, I don't know. But um, so anyway, that that has been my source. So uh, to be fair to any, anyone, um, I just don't think his importance has necessarily been explained before. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of writing about Hudson, um, but it's been mostly focused on his literature. So, I mean, uh, people obviously analysing his his writing his, uh, and his um, associations with South America and things. So that's been quite well covered. Yeah, yeah. I, I think perhaps because he has been misrepresented to an extent and that's why the, the book of Connor is so important because he has been represented almost like a writer of a bygone era and uh, they tend to go and look for quotes coming from him regarding things that are um, quaint let's say and the controversial things that make people to think of tend to be left behind. <laughs> uh, so I think we do need works like the one of Connor, and we need you know people like you who are here and who can learn about Hudson to spread the word here in in the UK, because Hudson's work is very well known in Argentina. People know about his, his conservation and, and and the importance that he gave to keeping nature as it is. Um, uh, and that's something that is not terribly well known here. And to an extent, it's something that I wonder if he was not already suffering while he was alive, because he was always an outsider here. Even when he got British uh, citizenship and eventually, he was always, when the people wanted to criticize him, they would raise the thing that he was coming from South America and that he was not really 100% English. Uh, and I wonder if that's not a little bit lurking in the background. Uh, 
But and that's why I think we have to explain to people that what he was doing and many of the topics that he was talking about are international, are global, are, are affects everybody regardless of where people were born. And in his case, everything that he did was very much a product of the Hispanic Anglosphere. I mean, it was the, what he learned in the Hispanic world and he applied to the Anglo world. And it, <coughs> that's the, the, the result. And, and it's, you know, us spreading the word. And, and I would love, if anybody knows the telephone number of Chris Paham, please tell me. Fantastic. Fantastic. I certainly sent him a, a what I certainly will do now that I know that is to send him a copy of this recording <laughs> and to let him know about the book of Connor. Yes, most I, definitely. I think there's been a bit of a, a, a sense with Hudson that um, he was anti-science. And again, I think it was inaccurate yeah. and unfair. It was not, it, I, 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 the Darwin thing, because he had the quite public spat with Darwin through the letters of the Zoological Society. So Hudson being I suppose um, not always very diplomatic. He accused, <laughs> he, he basically explained in this public forum that Darwin had got something quite badly wrong in Origin of Species, and Darwin was corrected it. But I think it it it, it left the impression that Hudson was uh, anti-evolutionary theory. Mm -hmm. Now, as Graciela said, he had some issues with Darwin. I mean, his best quote I think was Darwin um, wants some thinking. And I, I think he was right, you know, I mean, you know, and what he objected to was the idea that, that scientists thought, well, we've explained everything now, we can, you know, when actually, of course, it doesn't really explain everything. And, you know, things like the example with the cuckoo, I mean, you know, how a cuckoo, cuckoo chick knows from the moment it's born, you know, this behaviour, you know, and things like that. He, so he was, he was still very intrigued by the kind of magic uh, of things um, that weren't necessarily always explained by sort of, Binary mm. science. Yes. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you both about his personality and his character? Because he seems shy, he seems sometimes quite abrasive. And yet, reading your book, he's incredibly well networked. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of reconcile those two things? How does he emerge so prominently to connect with all these people? Is it just I his think, work and reputation? I prefer that he was shy. What he didn't want to be is in on the spotlight. Um, he wanted to be discreet. He didn't like fame. Uh, but he was a charmer and he knew how to deal with women very well and uh, and he appreciated and valued women and that in some way helped him enormously in building his networks, uh, particularly in the conservation area where women were playing a really pivotal mm -hmm. role. Uh, so, so yeah. and, and he was also even physically, uh, I mean, quite spectacular. He was incredibly tall, very slim, very handsome, frankly, from my point of view, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, and, and he was a very good speaker, too. So he had a great charisma. Yeah, yeah. it is a bit of a there, mm. there's a bit of an enigma thing there. And, yeah. um, so I, 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 I wouldn't hesitate to say that nowadays we call it social anxiety. Yeah. Mm. So he, he had he had his comfort zone. Mm. Uh, uh, but he also couldn't bear fine dining. He couldn't bear networking, mm -hmm. um, and he couldn't. Um, uh, yeah, he, he he would I think always wait until the last moment to see how he felt before taking up invitations to do social things. So he could do them, but he had to make sure he was you know mentally right at, at that moment, and and he never spoke on a public platform to adults. He couldn't do that either. Mm -hmm. um, but and yet, and although sometimes you know he would by that you know, can bear you know to be in a in high circles he was adopted one you know by a succession of very um well-to-do um aristocratic figures um and um so th there is a bit of a, a, a you know a, a, a you know a conflict there but but um but it just adds to the sort of i think intrigue of yeah. yeah. yes yeah. I was interested in seeing that uh, in South America he's recognised. Um, did he ever go back to South America? No, never, 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 never. Okay. No. So, no. He had a, he he was planning to go to Spain, for example, with with Don Roberto at some stage, and things didn't work out. So that was as much as he was going to go back to the Hispanic world. 
Uh, but no, he never went back to Argentina. No? In fact, it, it's interesting how sedentary he was in terms of his range after he, I mean, so he spent nearly 50 years here. Um, he went once to Ireland, um, which is odd because he understood he had an Irish grandmother, mm -hmm. um, but showed no particular affinity to Ireland beyond that. Um, and he went once to Scotland within months of arriving here and he never went back to Scotland either. He showed no interest in the uplands of Northern England, so he never went to the Lake District. He went once to the Peak District, so he very much his range. If you plotted Hudson's movements, you would you would find the kind of distribution map of, of a turtle dove or something <laughs> that, 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 that liked the, 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 the lowlands and the milder conditions. And I mean, it might have been something to do with his health. It was certainly something to do with his lo low income, his low resources. But that that was the pattern that that, that, that was established. And you know, he never went, you know, never mm -hmm. went back on the ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Oh, yes, uh, yeah. uh, with these women, especially when it comes to the, the Bush Society and all of this, I mean, it seems very, especially as you said, that uh, originally there were not many men. <laughs> so how do you get to know them? How do they work? Uh, yeah, it's a very, very good, um, intriguing question. How did Hudson become involved how, do, how did he come to be in the room you know imagine that very first meeting i believe it was in notting hill uh from what i can make out um and uh notting hill helps because it's close to where he actually lived um <coughs> you may have got to know eliza phillips who convened that first meeting um through other animal welfare organizations that she was involved in um, but we don't know there's a bit of a gap in sort of fossil record almost of exactly how they came to know each other um but it is just intriguing they obviously knew each other well enough that a she would bother to invite him you know so most men she think what's the point you know they won't come and b he was very very eager to attend and they must have known as well that he you know he would be nice to have there without you know and, and I think he absolutely had this sensitivity, I think, to um, you know, and it was remarked upon by by other people, uh, including Garnet, uh, Edward Garnet, who mentions you know, Hudson's sort of rapport um, with women. Um, again, you know, it's, it's something to do with his unusual background. I mean, um, uh, yeah, as Edward Thomas, his poet, war poet friend, dear friend Edward Thomas, very neatly put it, Hudson began by doing an eccentric thing for an English naturalist. He was born in South America. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is mm -hmm. this is the nub of it. This is, for me, what makes him tick and what makes him so interesting. I mean, partly, you know, I, 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 I slightly, you know, from somewhere else myself, so, you know, I've travelled as far as a lot of people travel for work, but I can find that quite relatable. Um, that aspect of being in this wonderful country, but seeing it from a slightly outsider's perspective. Um, anyway, that that's as much as we know. But but they they loved him. Didn't have any other friendships. Oh, yeah. all, all, uh, lifelong. Yeah. Oh, yeah, lifelong. Yeah. Well, I mean, Etta Lemon, for example, her tributes to him at the end of his life. I mean. And it was her who she she negotiated his his legacy with him his his his, his gift and his will, and um, I just yeah spoke very highly of him and he he stayed involved right to the end of his life, in a sort of advisory kind of trustee almost type of capacity, um, and and yeah when he was he was an activist right to the end. So. I think also part of the appeal is that he didn't patronize women. He valued what they were doing and he was a great listener. So he actually paid attention to whatever they had to say. Uh, and that, at the time, it was quite something. <laughs> that was not the attitude of most men. So that made him really very attractive and very valued. Uh, he was really welcome in all these meetings because he was always going to bring something positive. Yeah. 
I mean, another part of the, the Enigma thing, again, I mean, people are complex and contradictory, and I mean, you realise that, you know, before you know anybody, it's hard to generalise a person. He wasn't as socially radical as Don Roberto, for example, who was absolutely, you know, he called himself a socialist and was, had a whole list of, you know, the demands, including, you know, nationalisation of land and, you know, eight-hour working days and votes for women and all, all of the... And uh, founder of the Scottish Nationalist Party. Yeah, and the Labour Party as well. So, you know, you're doing all these things. And, and Hudson was very focused on the nature. Um, and I would say he took a, a, a sort of... Yeah, he, he, he... People say he was conservative with a small c. I mean, he picked and... He, he would pick and choose his causes. So he was, you know, he was as likely to be against certain, you know, certain things. As a, so, you know, he wasn't always kind of radical on, on a social agenda. I think he, having lived in a very volatile political environment in South America, it had taught him the value of not, you know, yeah. not making change too quickly. Like but but he was radical in, in the sense of being radical in the defense of nature and radical on the terrible bad impact that wealthy people were having on the ec ecology in general. So he realized that uh, a lot of wealth was uh, being turned into building things and, and that entailed destroying uh, both uh, the biodiversity, but also the rural heritage. And he was very radical on that. And he will actually look for people in parliament who will be supporting those sort of ideas, regardless of what party, political party they were from. So he could move from one extreme to other extreme. It didn't matter because he, cause was nature and biodiversity. And, uh, and that, that was it. Yeah, yeah. He was particularly angry through his life with wealthy people who, who paid, usually paid other people to collect things for them. Mm -hmm. He would pay good money for trophies. But that, that was a particular, um, Right to the end of his life, he wanted, you know, to carry on going after those people. And of course, a lot of those are important people. And I think even after he died, there was a bit of a hangover from that. Because I think some people still felt quite bruised about, you know, let's remember that for it took a long time, you know, for leg protection leg legislation to ban things like egg collecting. And, mm -hmm. um, and people were very proud of their egg collections, you know, and that, that's just one aspect. Mm -hmm. So Hudson is a bit like our conscience at that time, yeah? Yes, and, you yes. Know, um, <laughs> yes. You may say, a, you know, puritanical to some degree, um, but basically, you know, um, uh, you know, setting, you know, wanting, asking for a law. Yeah. And, he was a straight talking. He didn't have, he didn't mind his words. And uh, he even had... I mean, rows with powerful people. He had a big row with Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt uh, wrote the prologue of one of his books, and he thought, wow, he's going to be very much, you know, happy because of that. But he discovered that actually Theodore Roosevelt was a hunter, and that uh, and, and, and Theodore Roosevelt decided that he was going to have dialogue with him regarding the puma in Argentina, so that he knew a lot about the puma. And he said, no, no, what are you talking about? This, this, what you know is completely wrong. And he had no problem in criticizing Theodore Roosevelt, who was at the time very much respected in the US, imagine. Yeah. So he, he, when he came to nature, he was completely, you know, as I said, fearless and straight talking, and he could be very acid. And uh, really, a very, very activist person. Yes. Yeah. yeah, there's a nice Roosevelt link locally that you may be aware of. That he walked with Edward Grey. He came to Europe and Africa uh, in 1910, 11, uh, and he wanted to go bird watching. And so, um, Ed, Sir Edward Grey took him for a walk along the Etchum. Mm -hmm. uh, again, yes, you can. More detail available, but anyway, it's a, it's a nice link with you as well. Yes. Um, you picked out osprey, egret, those birds that he was particularly worried about. Were there other birds that we're now um, much less worried about that he was campaigning to save? Uh, in, yeah. During his, well, so his so his 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 book about the lost British birds, mm -hmm. I mean, lists you know um, a number of species. I I didn't go through them all, but you know things like bitterns and cranes and spoonbills and mm -hmm. uh, ibises and you know, uh, red kites, um, 
or, or spray. Uh, so anyway, there's a there's a whole list of them, and one by one we've got them back, um, and uh, partly through targeted conservation. So so that's that's something we've been good at, um, sorting out individual cases, creating the right places for them, obviously putting in place legislation that more or less stop people, uh, certainly trophy hunting here. Um, uh, so so there's loads of good news. Um, obviously the big things we're still grappling with <laughs> um, and uh, some of you know Hudson I think would obviously be struck by the lack of abundance maybe yeah. that we he, he would have known in his day of, of, of small nature um, like snakes and, and insects and things like that so um, but but yeah there's, you know I, when I give talks I, I, I try to end on the positives of, of how you know we can sort stuff out if we put our mind to it and, and it's thanks to um, organizations such as the one he helped establish yeah. Yeah. and the global network yeah. so i think we owe him a debt you know and, and i feel personally indebted and that's kind of why i'm standing here so yes <laughs> <laughs> anyone volunteering yes <laughs> yeah that would be lovely that would be really nice yes uh, when when um when i people say somebody shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, there's lots of people in, in, in our society and history who shouldn't have been forgotten. I mean, clearly, you know, resilient. And, and I think to back that up, you know, you, I think you have to cite somebody who isn't forgotten, who perhaps is no more deserving. So in Hudson's case, I usually mention Richard Jeffries, mm. who was an earlier nature writer, um, had died before Hudson had almost published anything. So he's from an earlier era. And again, you know, absolutely deserving of you know um, lasting renown. But but it's interesting. There's a Richard Jeffries Society that's thriving and very active and produces lots of great stuff. And his work is still being analysed and, and 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 great. I mean, I'm all for it. Um, but why not Hudson? Uh, uh, and that's an interesting question. And I think there's a few potential answers to it that some cleverer people than me might want to it would be a great thesis if anybody wants to take it on but yeah. uh but yes. but yeah um, yes but, but but you know we can you know read the book of connor and uh get acquainted with the hispanic anglosphere network and we have a lovely profile there of hudson too and spread the word around now that you know about him <laughs> and tell about this man and what he did and and perhaps I, i've been trying i'm well, you have been in the RSPB for a lot of time. Uh, I'm just a life member, you know, okay. uh, 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 an outsider. I'm, I'm, I'm just a person who's interested in nature. But I think probably the RSPB should be doing something more about Hudson, because frankly, Hudson left practically all his legacy to the RSPB with the idea that the RSPB will be um, uh, using the money for teaching in primary schools. I'm doing this series that I'm still doing of, um, um, how is it called, uh, the, the school. Uh, it's a particular series of um, uh, of events that I do in a school every year. And that's done with the money that Hudson left. So it would be nice well, if those bird and tree. birds and trees, exactly. Yeah. So if that could be called Hudson's bird and tree, perhaps, or something like that, in order to really, you know, make the point that it's done with the money that he left. Yeah. So uh, there's an interesting anecdote on, I mean, this is illustrative of how determined Hudson was to, to disappear. Um, Etta Lemon went to him to, right at the end of his life and said, my colleagues have got an, given me an idea to put to you. We want to create an annual Hudson lecture uh, to immortalise your name and as a thank you for you know this gift. And Hudson immediately said, "No, I'm not interested. First of all, I'm not interested in you lecturing to adults. It's a waste of time." <laughs> he said, "I don't want my name on anything, but you can put the money towards the education of children." It's that's where you have the maximum long term impact. And so um, I can understand why organisations don't look back. Uh, there's too much to do looking forward, probably. But uh, but that's partly, I think, why. Um, yeah, he, he, he disappeared and. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but, but maybe, yeah, maybe we can do more. Yes. Yes, and um, mainly to do more regarding what he has been alerting on us, the dangers of ecotourism, the dangers of 
the, the, the while uh, over development uh, and, uh, and to see if we can do something about it. And that will be the best homage that we can pay to, to Hudson. But despite coming here when he was 33, he seems to be to have been rediscovered in yeah. his native country. Oh, absolutely. You talked about film. His, oh, oh, my goodness, uh, yes. Can you I, say anything about this film? I, 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 I was taken as a child in an excursion to his birthplace and uh, and, and I read uh, Far Away and Long Ago, you know, it's part of the curriculum in, in Argentina. Uh, so he's very much a big name over there. Obviously, we don't know him as William Hudson, we know it as Guillermo Hudson. <laughs> Guillermo Enrique Hudson. Still, obviously, we know that in England he, he's called William Henry. Uh, but Yes, I think there's a lot of work to be done here in England rather than over there. Over there, they know very well what William Hudson was all about, um, and, and they keep it in mind all the time. Uh, it's here where he has been forgotten, which is, is bizarre. Hmm. It's really bizarre. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. right. Well, we're almost out of time, so if we could thank the speakers again for their oh. wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just a moment to say that we have a talk coming up on the 22nd of November on the use of atomic energy in controlling pests in Mexico in the 1940s, 1950s, following on, on the Manhattan Project and all that. And he's uh, um, uh, associate professor from UCL, um, Thomas Rush, coming to give us that talk. So please come and join us. Okay. So thank you very much and thank you very much those ones at home and I'll stop the recording now.